Hello, it's another great day to be going through God's Word. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert, and we are starting a new series within our series. So the whole topic we're dealing with is the book of Revelation, and specifically, I titled what we're doing this teaching series, Revealing Revelation. Now, within Revealing Revelation, there's a lot of subtopics, and what we're doing is we're covering the entire book from Revelation 1, 1 to 22, 22, and every verse in between. We literally will have read out loud every verse of the book by the time that we're done. So the subject we're going to deal with today is actually one that we've talked about a fair amount already. We have talked about the tale of two cities. We talked about God's people being the holy city. And we've also talked about the enemy's people being the great city. And the Revelation discusses in detail both. Well, today's day, we're going to bounce back to the other side, to the bad guys. And we're going to cover all of chapters 13, 17, and 18. So we're definitely checking off chapters as we go. And a lot of what we're going to look at, actually, we've talked about before. And now you're going to understand why we did all that preemptive work, because when we're going through and actually looking at the book of Revelation, it's a lot easier now. So even though a lot of this may be review, I still think review is a good thing, particularly since we're dealing with so much information that it's a good thing to go back and see through it again and maybe create some different uh, contextual understanding. So maybe now you see it a little more clearly than you did before. Anyway, we're going to try. So let's get started. So the book uh, of Revelation is actually titled The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And I like saying it like it is because that's really what was intended because the entire book is meant to reveal Jesus. That, that's one of the things we covered back in the very first chapter of Revelation. It's one of the very first things we covered. This is all about Jesus. And today's topic is going to be about a tale of two cities. And we're going to look at the other guys, the bad guys, the great cities. So in our total plan, we have covered the major players, the demonic kingdom, and the seven angels of power. We've looked at chapters 1, 2, and 3, uh, which was the age of the church. We've looked at chapters 7, 14, and 21, titled The Last Generation, God's People. Now we're going to look at the enemy's people, and that's going to cover chapters 13, 17, and 18. And we've titled this before, A Tale of Two Cities. So in terms of chapters... We will be almost halfway done by the time we get done today. And actually, a lot more of these sections we're looking at are far shorter than the ones that we've gone through. We're actually a lot farther along in the study than, than it looks like here. So the things we'll be looking at are the competition, chapter 13, chapter 17, and chapter 18. So the first theme is the competition. That's one we've already looked at quite a bit. So we've got the great city, the enemy's people, and the holy city, God's people. There you go, in all their glory. So the great city is first discussed in Daniel 2, 40 through 43. It says, Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So, like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces, in that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men. But they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. So the fourth kingdom is just another title for the enemy's kingdom. And when we talk about the great city, that is the last version of the enemy's kingdom that we will see during the great tribulation, which is what the book of Revelation describes. Now, as for the holy city, we see the same beginning at the same time. Book of Daniel, chapter 2, verses 44 through 45. In the days of those kings, so the ones we just described, the fourth kingdom, 
and there were three others before it. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God who has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So we know who the stone is. That's Jesus. Jesus will put an end to all of these other kingdoms. So Julius Caesar converted the Roman Republic to a dictatorship. Then his nephew Augustus became the first Caesar of the Roman Empire from 27 BC to 14 AD. Jesus Christ was born in (laughs) OO during the reign of Augustus, so the first Caesar which fulfilled Jewish prophecy, plus he started the church. So the Roman Empire and the church had their beginnings the exact same time. A fully, you know, world-conquering empire against one guy. And guess who ends up winning? Our guy, Jesus. So this is Revelation 17, 18. The woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So we saw the beginning of the great city in the Roman Empire. Now we'll see the end of the Roman Empire, the great city in Revelation. And Revelation 11, 8 says, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Now the holy city, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. That's Matthew 5, 14 through 15. Revelation 3, 12 says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God in my new name. So, Scripture continually references these two competing cities. Revelation 18, 15 through 17 says, The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, she who is clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, For in one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste. And later, Revelation 18, 18 through 19. And every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour, she has been laid waste. Revelation eleven two, Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Revelation 29, and they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So when we put these passages together, we see that the ending for the great city is set in stone. It's God's word. It's going to happen. They will be destroyed. We also see that they will fight against the holy city. They will literally, uh, you know, militarily fight against them, as we see in Revelation 11, 2 and 29. But in the end, Revelation 21, 2, the holy city comes out on top. They endure forever after crushing the other city. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. Revelation 11, 13. 
And in that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Revelation 14, 20. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Now the holy city. Revelation 21, 10 through 12. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Again, we see the destruction of the great city we see the triumph of the holy city, which is composed of both God's Jewish children and his children from the church. Revelation 18, 9 and 10. And the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Revelation 18.21 Then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. Revelation 21.14 And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the apostles of the Lamb. Revelation 21, 23, and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the lamb. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Revelation 22, 14. So we're faced with two distinctly different outcomes for each city. And if it's a competition, it's already been set in stone, who wins? Now, I love this quote from Charles Dickens. No, he wasn't writing scripture. I don't know, maybe he was being prophetic, but um, I just feel like it's very appropriate for what we've been discussing. So this is from his famous book, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the season of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. And in the end, everybody's going one direction or the other. You're with this city or you're with that city. And the winner is, as if it was in question, the holy city. So what have we learned? So this competition, uh, Daniel described the beginning of the competition. The Roman Empire and the church began at the same time. And Revelation describes the final showdown of the two cities as well as the outcome. We win. The good guys win. So we're now going to take a look at chapter 13, and that's going to discuss um, things we've already talked about. It's going to talk about the Antichrist, the beast from the sea. It's going to talk about behemoth, the beast from the earth. But as we're going through and covering each chapter, I didn't want to skip it. So even though, yes, we've talked about these things before, I just don't think it hurts to talk about them again. And we may get a little more insight the second time. So Revelation 13.1 starts by saying, And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Now, that short sentence has very powerful meaning. And for God's people, it's, it's not a good one. The dragon, who we know as Satan, has his feet on the sand of the seashore, meaning he has power over it. Remember that in Scripture, it says many times it talks about God putting God's enemies under the feet of Jesus and under our feet. Well, that principle of your enemies being under your feet applies here also. The dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. What's important here is who is the seashore? And the sand of the seashore represents the children of God. 
This goes back to Genesis 22, 17 and God's promise to Abraham. Satan's kingdom on earth will reach its fruition and have power over God's children during the tribulation. The origin of the great city is in the book of Daniel. Not sure why I put the second part, but Satan's kingdom will have dominion over God's people for three and a half years. And that's what that statement is saying. The dragon stood at his feet on top of the sand of the seashore, and the sand of the seashore are God's people. Daniel 2, 31 through 40 says, You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue, that statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So we know from previous study that the head of gold is the kingdom of Babylon. The chest and the arms of silver are the Medes and the Persians who took over for Babylon as the reigning kingdom on the earth. Then the belly, of thigh, the belly and thighs of bronze are the kingdom of ancient Greece, which took over from the Medes and Persians. And actually these transitions were all described in the book of Daniel. Lastly, the legs of iron is the kingdom of ancient Rome. And at the ends of those legs are the feet of iron and clay. And the kingdom is divided three times. So it says here, restored Rome. Those aren't my words. Rome was never restored. Rome kept persevering and changing and evolving. And of course, lastly, the crushing rock is Jesus. Jesus is the rock who will destroy all those four kingdoms. So the statue provides the history of Lucifer's earthly kingdom. The four kingdoms are in order, Babylon the gold, Persia, Persia the silver, Greece bronze, and lastly Rome, iron and clay. We know that Jesus is the stone which the builders rejected, who then becomes the chief cornerstone. Jesus came to earth and performed his earthly ministry during the reign of the first Caesar at the onset of the Roman Empire. So from the beginning, the two kingdoms have been in direct competition with one another. In the end, Jesus destroys the Roman Empire. The stone crushes the feet of iron and clay, which likewise destroys the entire statue. And victorious Jesus becomes a great mountain, which fills the entire earth. The imagery of the Roman Empire being feet is significant because it illustrates the dominion over the children of God under the statue's feet that will occur at the end of the train. Historically, the kingdom split into two factions, east and west, then split again and moved north. These divisions are symbolized by the division of the iron and the clay. Lastly, when the eighth king of the Roman Empire arises, the Antichrist, scripture says that he will be one of ten kings from the east during the Great Tribulation. This is represented by the ten toes on the feet, Revelation 17.12. So back to Revelation chapter 13, this is verse 2. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne in great authority. So Revelation 12.3 tells us the text, that's, the text states that the dragon, Lucifer, had seven heads and ten horns. That's from Revelation 12.3, the chapter before what we just read. We see the transfer of the heads and the horns to the beast from the sea, the fourth beast, Leviathan, in Revelation 13.2. So Lucifer gives his power to the beast from the sea, to Leviathan, 
who will then raise up in human form as the Antichrist. The beast now has the seven heads and ten horns. The dragon transfers his kingdom to the beast. We see that in Revelation 13, 4. So all that is taking place in the spiritual realm. What we're going to see in the physical realm is just the raising up of the Antichrist in Russia. If we're following this correctly, that's the third version of the Roman Empire. So Psalm 74, 13, 14 says this. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea monsters in the waters. You crushed the heads of the Leviathan. You gave him his food for the creatures of the wilderness. So this is God speaking about Leviathan, the great sea monster, that God breaks his heads, right? That God crushes the heads of the Leviathan. Isaiah 27, 1 says, In that day, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. Revelation 13, 2 shows the same four kingdoms portrayed in Daniel's statue, but this time they appear as beasts. Daniel chapter 7 also described these four kingdoms as beasts, as a lion for Babylon, as a bear for the Medes and Persians, as a leopard for Greece, and lastly, Rome, which isn't given an animal to depict it. But once more, it's shown as, as containing iron as teeth, and portrayed as being the most terrible and powerful. So Daniel described those same four kingdoms two different ways. He described them the first time as a statue. The second time he described them as beasts. And we see these beasts as, as it says here, a lion, a bear, and a leopard. All four beasts are seen as coming up from the sea because that is the scriptural representation of Lucifer's kingdom. They come up from the sea one at a time in the book of Daniel. When they come up in Revelation chapter 13, they're seen as one beast coming up out of the sea. Because just like the statue is one statue containing four different parts, the beasts are one beast containing four different parts. Revelation 13, 2 shows that the fourth kingdom has all the attributes of the first three kingdoms, or beasts, which can collectively be viewed as part of a single entity, one statue, one beast. We know from other verses that the beast from the sea is Leviathan. He emerges to lead the fourth beast. Lucifer gives him the authority to lead Lucifer's kingdom. He receives power, a throne, and great authority from Lucifer. So remember that Leviathan is the keeper of hell. So as he's coming up out of the sea, he's leaving hell to come in earthly form to lead the fourth kingdom at the end of days. The vision of seven heads and ten horns gives the full and final picture of Lucifer's kingdom. The four beasts represent the four historical kingdoms, Babylon, Medes, Persians, Greece, and Rome. Hopefully we got this by now. The seven heads describe the leadership or the kings of the final kingdom. So the Roman Empire, now we're looking at seven heads, okay? So we started off with the beast showing the historical kingdom. For the last kingdom, we're seeing seven heads describing the kingship or the leadership over it. Then Revelation 17, 11 says the seventh king will become an eighth king, the Antichrist during the Great Tribulation. So that's the last king of the Roman Empire. Last Caesar. The Antichrist will be one of ten more kings brought to power. These kings are represented on the statue as ten toes on the feet of iron and clay. So those last kings get raised up during the tribulation. So we begin with the four kingdoms of the enemy. The fourth kingdom, then we are describing it as seven heads. All right. And then Within those seven heads, one of them will get killed and raised up as the eighth head. And then that eighth head will be part of ten more kings. So we see a complete historical continuum. And we see the images that scripture uses to show those different parts, those different time frames within the whole uh, kingdom of hell. 
Revelation 17, 7 to 13 says this, And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. So we're specifically talking about Leviathan, the beast from the sea, because it has the seven heads and the ten horns. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, so those who are not God's children, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. But we know from previous work that the seven mountains refer to the religious part of the Roman Empire. And of course, the seven kings refer to the political headship of the Roman Empire. And then the mystery we've already looked at, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an ape and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom. That won't happen until the tribulation at the very end. But they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. Remember that one hour is another description of the tribulation, the hour of testing. This is that one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. So the seven heads and ten horns are mentioned five times in Revelation. In Daniel, the seven heads are never mentioned. It never talks about those seven heads that are the leadership of the Roman Empire. The ten horns, however, are. They are prominently discussed, and they give great insight into the character and future actions of the Antichrist. So they're discussed both in Daniel and in Revelation. Daniel 7, 7, and 8 says this, After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts which were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boast. So from the ten horns, one little one comes up among them is one of the ten. Daniel 7.11 says, Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. So the beast from the sea, Leviathan, and the little horn, which is raised up as one of the ten kings, same guy we're talking about, the Antichrist. The Antichrist is the physical, earthly person who will be raised up. Leviathan is the spiritual leader who will inhabit the Antichrist, who will possess the Antichrist. Daniel 7, 19 to 26 says this, Then I desire to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell, namely, that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts and which was larger in appearance than its associates. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the Highest One. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Then he said, The fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise and another will arise after them. And he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law and they will be given into his hand for a times, 
times and half a time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Daniel 8, 9 through 14 says, Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as he was might, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the hosts, and it removed the re regular sacrifice from him, and the place of the sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? While the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, and then the holy place will be properly restored. So we see the role of the small horn is, it's crucial, it's key, it's vital. It's the Antichrist being talked about, and he specifically tells us what he's going to do. Yeah, 8, 23 through 26 says, in the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise Insolent and skilled in entry, his power will be mighty, but not by his own power, and he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people, and through his shrewdness he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence, and he will magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. The vision of the evenings and mornings, which has been told, is true. But keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. So the king described here, that is the small horn, same guy. And we see more things that he is going to do. So when it says he will oppose the prince of princes, Jesus was the king of kings and lords of lords. But the seven chief princes are the seven ages of the throne room. The prince of princes is Melchizedek. And remember, he's coming in earthly form. He's going to inhabit a human body to lead the children of God. And the Antichrist will oppose him firsthand. And of course, the prince of princes will oppose him also. And they will do battle and they will battle it out. And we know who wins. The little horn is the Antichrist, one of the final ten kings who will reign for three and a half years, time, times, and half a time. He overthrows three kings and rises in their place, leaving seven plus one. The little horn is bigger than the other horns. He has a mouth uttering great boasts. He will speak out against the Most High. He will wage war against the saints and wear them down. He will attempt to make alterations in times and law. He will magnify himself to make himself equal with the commander of the host, with Jesus. He will call himself God. He will remove the regular sacrifice from the commander of the host. So meaning communion will no longer be dedicated to Jesus. He will fling truth to the ground. He will perform his will and prosper. He will be insolent and skilled in intrigue, and his power will be mighty. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. Through shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. So you can see the description of what the Antichrist, otherwise known as the small horn, is going to do is significant. He is the leader of the bad guys. What else can you say? And he will magnify himself in his heart. Remember, Pharaoh did the same thing. Remember, Leviathan was the spirit being who inhabited Pharaoh. So if you want to learn about what the Antichrist is going to be like, take a look at Pharaoh. He will destroy many while they are at peace. He will oppose the prince of princes, Melchizedek, 
and he will be broken without human agency, meaning God will be the one who destroys him. His dominion will be taken away, and he will be annihilated and destroyed forever. Revelation 13, 3-6 says this, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. Remember, we just talked about that earlier. The dragon gives his authority to the beast. So as people worship the Antichrist, they're really worshiping Lucifer. It says, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Well, remember, what did the small horn do? He had a big mouth, and he spoke arrogant words and blasphemies against God. And he was given three and a half years to act, time, times, and half a time. And he opened his mouth and blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. So the seven heads are seven kings. Revelation 17.10 tells us that specifically. The seventh head that will be slain is the seventh king. He will die, but then its fatal wound will be healed. He will be resurrected and come back to life. This event is mentioned multiple times in Revelation. And when that false death and resurrection comes, that's when the tribulation officially begins and the age of the church is officially Revelation 13, 12, he, the beast from the earth, the false prophet, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. So again, it's telling us straight up what's going to happen. The Antichrist will be a world leader. He'll be the last leader of the Roman Empire. If we're reading scripture right, that's Russia. So that leader of Russia is going to die and be resurrected. When he is resurrected, he will come back, declare himself God, declare himself head of the church, and the age of the tribulation will begin for three and a half years. And then he will do all the horrible things that Daniel described. Revelation 13, 14 says, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. It's telling us straight up this is going to happen. Death and resurrection, a false resurrection of the Antichrist. Revelation 17, 8 says, the beast that you saw was, he was alive, and is not, he died, and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. Well, the abyss is hell. So the physical person will die and be resurrected. The spiritual being who will inhabit him is Leviathan, who has been the leader of hell. But then Lucifer promotes him and makes him the leader of his physical kingdom on earth. And it says, and those who dwell on the earth whose names have been written in the book of life since the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. The beast that was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven and goes to destruction. So the seven kings applies to the time of the Roman Empire. When that seventh king dies, is resurrected, and comes back as the Antichrist, that's when he's the eighth king. The death and resurrection of the seventh king is a mockery of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The description assigned to him, the beast who was and is not and is about to come, is another mockery of the title given to God the Father, who was and who is and who is to come. This signifies the beast from the sea will proclaim himself to be God. He will declare himself as God and head of the church. So the seventh king who is res resurrected becomes the eighth king. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction, Revelation 17, 11. The eighth king will declare himself as God and head of the church. 
2 Thessalonians 2, 3, uh, and 4 says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So the apostasy is, is the death and resurrection of the physical being, the physical leader who will become the Antichrist. He opposes and exalts himself above every. He calls himself God, and he takes his seat in the seat of the temple of God. Well, remember what we've looked at. The temple of God is not a physical place. It's not a building in the New Testament. The temple of God is God's people. So when he takes his seat in the temple of God, that's the place where God sits. So he will display himself as being God, and he will take authority over the church and call himself the head of the church. Second Thessalonians was telling us what's going to happen beforehand in Revelation. In the New Testament, the temple is the body of Christ, God's people, the church. When the Antichrist is resurrected, he will declare and exalt himself as God. This is the apostasy. This will reveal the man of lawlessness who will become the Antichrist. The eighth king is the little horn described by Daniel. In Revelation 13, 3 through 6, the qualities of the eighth king are the same as those listed in Daniel's book about the small horn, an arrogant mouth uttering blasphemies against God, against his tabernacle, and against those who dwell in heaven. All of the earth who do not stay faithful to Jesus will follow the Antichrist. You're going to go one direction or the other. You're part of the great city or you're part of the holy city. There will be no place for being in between. Revelations 13, 7 through 10 says, It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. Okay, so... God's people will refuse to give in to the deception. God's people will refuse to worship the Antichrist. God's people will remain true to Jesus to the very end. That is called the perseverance and the faith of the saints, even at the cost of their own life, because we know some will be martyred for the, their perseverance. Some will persevere to the end to be raptured with Jesus. Both groups have to undergo the same test, though. So the Antichrist will make war with the saints will overcome them. He will be given authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. This phrase is used three times in scripture, all in the book of Revelation, and implies everyone who lives in the world, the entire earth. All who do not remain faithful to Jesus will follow him. The wheat will be separated from the chaff, and all humanity will have to choose either the true king or the false king. This is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. The phrase, if anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed, is a direct message to God's children that we are to submit to the events taking place. We are not to fight against them. Our job is to remain faithful to Jesus. It is not to directly fight the Antichrist. We resist the Antichrist. We don't fight against him. Matthew 26, 52 told us this specifically. Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. So even as Jesus was being led to death, he told his followers, you are not to fight. You are not to physically fight. You are to endure and persevere and be faithful to me. I will take care of the fight. I will be the one who defeats the enemy. So God's purpose for Jesus to go to the cross to die for the sins of mankind. God's purpose was for Jesus to go to the cross to die for the sins of mankind. 
Peter was fighting against the will of God when he took up arms. Revelation is clear that God's children will be equally disobedient and out of God's will if they try to fight back. The purpose of God is for his children to show their love and faith by laying down their lives rather than worship a false god. Revelation 24 says, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation 13, 11 through 14 says this. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. So now we're going to talk about the false prophet. And we've looked at these passages before too. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of man. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. So the beast from the earth is behemoth, the false prophet. We've covered that in previous lessons. Behemoth and Leviathan, death and Hades, the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth, the false prophet and the Antichrist. These two beings are always seen in tandem. Having two horns like a lamb falsely represents God's people. Jesus is the lamb. The two horns are for Israel and the church. But he speaks as a dragon. He is a false prophet. He is a false religious leader trying to falsely portray himself as a leader of God's people. His authority comes from the Antichrist. He is the head of the Antichrist's false religion whose purpose is to get the world to worship the Antichrist. And he will use the false resurrection of the Antichrist as his platform to deceive the world. So remember, the beast that comes up out of the sea has seven heads and ten horns. Okay? Two separate things. Um, actually, I don't think I want to go there. Anyway, the well, no, I do. So the seven heads, that's what I want. The seven heads represent two different things. Okay? Seven heads is ten kings. It's also the seven hills that the city sits on. The seven hills the city sits on are Rome, and that is the place of the Catholic Church. So when we see the seven heads, it's, also, it's both the political kingdom of the Antichrist and it's the religious kingdom of the Antichrist. And they're going to work together. The Antichrist and the false prophet, the false religion and the false empire. They're both going to be as one, and they're going to work together to wear down and destroy God's people. So the false prophet will perform false miracles as part of his deception. Revelation 13, 15 through 18 says, And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell, except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is the wisdom, or here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. So the image of the resurrected Antichrist will be used to deceive the world. The world would be required to worship his image or die. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego face the exact same challenge. The false prophet will force people to accept allegiance to the Antichrist or not be allowed to buy or sell. They will not be allowed to eat food. Okay? So either you worship the Antichrist and eat or don't worship the Antichrist and don't eat. We're going to get you one way or the other. 
So the mark of the beast is a mockery of the Jewish sign worn on their foreheads and hand is an act of allegiance to Jehovah, Deuteronomy 6 8. The meaning of the number 666 is open to speculation. A lot's been said on it. I don't have direct revelation on that, so I'm, I'm going to skip that one. We just know it refers to the Antichrist. Probably enough said. So what have we learned? Chapter 13. The fourth beast is the last kingdom described in Revelation. It is the last version of the Roman Empire. The little horn from Daniel and the beast from the sea in Revelation are one and the same. It's meant to show the works of the Antichrist and what he's going to do. The perseverance of the saints is the willingness of God's children to lay down their lives rather than worship a false god. So that was a lot of information. I'm willing to bet without looking at the time, that's going to be the longest video that we've done. But I felt it was important to really go through this information. And a lot of it we have looked at before, but I'm hoping we went into it with greater detail today. Uh, our next video is going to be about chapters 17 and 18, which is the same thing. It's talking about the great city. It's talking about the last version of the Roman Empire. It's talking about the enemy camp, the enemy city, the enemy people. And we need to know who we're fighting against so that we can know how we are supposed to respond. And I think that the big takeaway there at the end is one we need to remember, is that we are not to physically fight against the Antichrist. We are to resist when we're told that we are to worship a false god. God is very happy with us if we are willing to lay down our lives. If the opportunity comes, just as Jesus laid down his life for us. He is not glorified if we take up arms. That is not his will. All this is happening for a purpose, and that is to test the hearts of all men across the planet. And we're either going to fail, or we're going to uh, we're either going to fail that test, or we're going to pass that test. God's people will pass the test not by taking up arms. We're not trying to physically defeat the enemy empire. We win by laying our life down to Jesus. Well, I, I, I think there's a lot to think about and pray about here. So take your time. Go back. Watch this again, go through it, pray to God, is this really your voice speaking? Is this what you want me to hear? And if it is, then I'll see you again next time. God bless.